whether you're picking and grinning or just picking or just grinning, grab a drink, pull up a seat. It's time for Roots Music Rambler. Turn it up. All right, so uh, House 50. <laughs> well, <laughs> fine. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, have been feeling like 50 since 46. I don't know. <laughs> so, you know, no different. Sure. I feel, though, like I'm more comfortable, in, you know, in the like four days that I've been 50. But I'm feeling more comfortable just telling people to bugger off and, you know, like. <laughs> exactly. You know, like I'm, pretty soon I'm going to be sitting on the porch with my cane yelling at the kids to get off the grass. But Get um, off my lawn. There you go. Yeah. Rehearse but, that. Other than, I mean, yeah, it's it's fine. It's fine. Everything's fine. <laughs> That's funny. So, did uh, how did the birthday celebration go? Did you did you have the full on Nathan Graham and everything else, or or no? No. Aw. No. He actually Nathan and Tom were texting back and forth, and Nathan had ended up having to record with another person, Joe George, who plays with Nathan's band sometimes. And, you know, Nathan invited us to go to the recording session just because it was my birthday. But nice. in the meantime, we had made plans with for to have my family over. So oh. my siblings, their spouses and their children came over. And then like lifelong friends of ours, their girls that we grew up with, and, you know, total, like, we're taking it back now with the, like, Italian-American, like, <laughs> lifestyle. Their grandmother and my grandmother were best friends, oh, you nice. know, like, generations ago. And then my dad and their dad were best friends. And there's a lot of, like, parallels with their lives and ours. But we are still friends. And we get together for such occasions. So they showed up, sure. which was a surprise. I didn't know that they were going to come over. So it was fun. We drank a lot and ate a lot and <laughs> laughed a lot. Of course. So it was cool. And I, I was once, I'm not Italian myself, but I was married into an Italian family for a while. And uh, I, I would imagine that everything, all the conversations start and end in the kitchen. Is that accurate? We don't leave the kitchen. That, so it's exactly what I thought. Okay. And there's probably more food than anyone can possibly eat laying around the house, right? Typically. Yeah, yeah. And on the holidays, do you do the do you do the full, you know, seven fishes and shit? Oh, hell yeah. That's okay. our Christmas Eve. Okay. Like that is my favorite day of the year because the sure. food is tremendous. Sure. I shouldn't ask this. I, I know the answer to this, but I know a bunch of other people don't. Is it uh, just marinara or meat sauce? So, first of all, we don't call it sauce. It's gravy. Oh. Um, that's a very Italian-American thing. It's very regional, though, like from different parts of Italy. So my mom's family comes from around Naples. My dad's family comes from Calabria. But both families, my mom's family and my dad's family, always called it gravy. Gravy. And okay. I know this debate ruffles a lot of feathers. It's kind of like the <laughs> does Wilco suck debate, right? It, <laughs> it can It can get that intense. But a lot of people do, you know, people feel very strongly on both sides. Sure. We just call it gravy because that's what it was always called. I mean, I don't care. You want to call it sauce? Call it sauce. What do I care? Okay. So m when my mom makes Sunday gravy, she cooks it like she puts the, the meat in the gravy, but she doesn't, it's not like a bolognese, right? It's just more for flavor. And then to serve the pasta with, with the gravy on it, you know, if there's not like pieces of meat in it. It's so it's kind of like, a, as we say, marinade, but, <laughs> um, not officially, not technically, yeah. because there is some meats okay. mixed in there. Yeah. All right. So I, I make my own spaghetti sauce, if you want to want to call it that. But I love basically meat sauce. I love marinara with, you know, ground beef and sausage and other things in it. Yeah. So it's not pure Italian. I know it's not. I don't apologize for it because it's what I like and that's fine. And I don't, I'm not obnoxious about it if I'm not going to claim it to be Italian. But that's how I make spaghetti sauces. I put meat in it and a few other yeah. things. It's yummy. And I like it. So. If it tastes good. Yeah. Now, my in -law, my former in-laws, my former mother-in-law, uh, rest in peace, Judy, she made good old-fashioned traditional meatballs oh, yeah. to go with the marinara sauce that she made on, on pasta. And it's probably my son's favorite meal. Uh, and should be. It's his grandmother's, right? Sure. So he should like that. And I loved it too. Her spaghetti and meatballs were fantastic. I loved them. And I would probably pick them over my own 
uh, meat sauce any sure. day of the week. But <laughs> you know, pure Italian. I tell you this. I mean, let me tell you this story. This is funny. My mother used to do this all the time, which always drove me crazy. My mother is also not Italian. Okay. But she grew up with one, like one of her best friends was Italian, like parents or grandparents off the boat Italian, right? And every time we would eat at either my in-law's house or some other Italian family or even an Italian restaurant, my mother made it a point to say, real Italians eat their spaghetti like this. And she would twirl the pasta on her fork while holding the pasta with the spoon. The spoon, yeah. Which I know some people do that, but not all people do that. And I always thought it was really obnoxious of my mother to do that in front of other Italians. Like, what are you doing? Like, either they know that right. and they think you're an idiot or they think you're an idiot. <laughs> so what are you doing? But, you know, that's my mom. She just interjects herself sometimes. Well, fine. as moms do. As moms do. Anyway, welcome to Roots Music Rambler. She's Frank. He's Falls. And we're rambling on through the stories behind the music we love. And today on the show, Jason got to spend some time with one of his favorite local bands last week who are back after a long layoff. So yeah. fill us in. Yeah. So the name of the band is Digby and the people around Louisville who have been around Louisville for a while know who they are. I think it's probably unfair to call them a Louisville bar band, but that's kind of what they've been. They had some modest success back in the uh, late 90s and 2000s. They I think some of their songs were picked up in TV and movies, and I think they had one like indie hit that made a chart somewhere along the way, but they never really made it out of playing mo mostly in this region. They've been labeled a power pop band, oh. but they evolved from a band called Hundred Acre Wood, which was much more folksy acoustic pop. So they have a little bit of that Americana flavor to them and in their DNA. And they have not had an album, an LP come out since 2007. And so oh. for the first time in 17 years... And actually, they haven't played since 2000, I think, 13 or 14. Oh, wow. Um, and so Rich, the lead guitarist, kind of got burnt out on the music business and, you know, the, the grind of it all. Mm -hmm. And he had two kids and a job. And so he just kind of put down the guitar and walked away from it. And the guys kind of cajoled him and his wife kind of, you know, poked him a little bit. And they got him, you know, to come, come back and start playing again. Well, Paul, the lead singer... As they got back and started playing just some old stuff to just, you know, get together as a group and be friends again. It wasn't you know, anything abnormal. But Paul, you know, kind of slyly said, well, I've got some new material, so maybe we should try this. And the magic started happening again. And uh, Digby now is back together. They have an album coming out March 1st. Ooh. We are actually going to, they had their, their first single actually debuted on WFPK, the local public music station here in town last week. And we actually have the exclusive. We get to play three other songs on the show today, just clips. We're not going to play the whole thing because we want you to go get the album. But we get to debut three cuts from that album on the show today. So nobody nice. else has heard them except us. Yeah. So very cool. So, yeah. Nice. Uh, but anyway, and I'll, I'll admit, I have to kind of give you a forewarning going into this interview. I am a an absolute Digby fanboy. Mm -hmm. I was first introduced to them by my ex-wife, who uh, a friend of a friend was connected with the band. And so we would go watch them play. Well, I, at that point in my life, I was in my mid-20s. I had never hung out with bands before. I didn't know what that lifestyle was like. I would see a few playing in bars every now and then, and I'd go to concerts, but I had no exposure to bands. Digby was the first band where I went to their show. And then afterwards, we were all out on the patio of the bar, smoking and drinking and telling lies like you do. And I was <laughs> hanging out with the band. And I did not You're separate. Like, Look at me. Yeah. I thought I was cool. I wasn't, but I thought I was. And so I did not separate Digby in my mind from Van Halen or Aerosmith or Green Day or anybody else I listened to at the time. I just thought they were a band and they were cool. And I knew a couple of them. Nice. Kind of tangentially. So I am a admitted Digby fanboy. And I, when I see them in public, I like pee myself a little bit and oh my and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, <laughs> I get real excited when I see them out there and, 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 and they're in Louisville. So I see them every now and then. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I probably make them very uncomfortable. So. <laughs> 
Well, as you're explaining your fanboydom, you know, I'm thinking as I'm listening to you, oh, it's kind of like how I am with Nathan Graham. And then you like right after I had that thought, you said that when you see them out in public, you pee a little. And I'm like, nope, nope, not going to say that because I definitely don't do that when I see Nathan. <laughs> well, I, I don't actually pee a little, but I get excited. I know. And, and Rich, Rich is the lead guitar player. He and his wife, Becky, actually live like a couple neighborhoods over. So I'll see them out at dinner or I'll go over. There's a little neighborhood bar over there. I'll go over and have a drink. And sometimes they're in there. And every time they are, I'm like, oh, my God, it's Rich from Digby. Hey, what's up? How you doing? You know, every now and then Becky gives me a look like, oh, shit. <laughs> we got to keep an eye on this one. <laughs> so, and I told him when I told him I wanted to interview him for the podcast and help him with this new album. I said, I'm I'm just going to apologize ahead of time. I'm a huge fanboy. I'm going to sound like a complete dork. This is going to be really awkward, but I love you guys and I want to have you on the show. And they said, sure, no problem. So love Rich, it. Paul, and Ben, three of the five members will be here today on the big show. And we get to debut cuts, uh, three cuts from the album. So we've never done that before. That That's is cool. super exciting. Yeah, for sure. Also on the show, we'll do our normal pick in the grin in, right? Mm -hmm. We'll share mm -hmm. our picks, whose music is making us grin. They might be new artists, might be old, but they'll sure be good. Before we kick it all off, though. What is up with our with our boys, with Boy Genius? What what the hell? <laughs> There's some, some announcement that they're on hiatus? Mm -hmm. What's going on? Yeah, so I saw that over the weekend and... The first thing I did, I think I saw it like on Instagram, Pitchfork posted something about it. So I sent it to Lucia because, you know, big fans, right? As is your daughter, Katie. And she sent back like, even though we were like two rooms apart, she sent back like cry face emojis. And mm -hmm. apparently she already knew, but didn't think to share with me. So yeah, now I, I mean, I get it. There's three of them. They each have their own solo mm -hmm. careers, you know? And so I was reading other people's comments about it, like discussions and whatnot. And a couple of people are like, hey, they are masters of the media, right? They, they're geniuses when it comes to this stuff. So, you know, it could be 100% true, or it could just be like, let's see what happens if we put this information out there. If there's the demand, yeah, maybe we'll supply a little bit more. But I mean, honestly, I don't know what what's really going to happen. How, how would I know? But yeah, it's kind of sad. I do appreciate Phoebe Bridger's solo stuff. And I definitely like Lucy Dacus. I, of the three, I probably like her solo stuff the most. So I know that they'll still be around, just not in that like collective entity that we know and love as boy genius. I think you're probably right. I think you're onto something that they, this was probably just a, not a publicity stunt per se, but you know, they've got their own solo projects. They've been on tour and doing the boy genius thing for a year or so now. So it's time for them to go migrate off and do their things and then, you know, come back together at some point with a new album or, I mean, hell the way artists are working these days, you know, maybe it's just you know, a month later, they'll say, oh, never mind. We're, we're, we're going to, we're in the studio now. Yeah. So, who knows? You sent me the article and then I sent it on to Katie. I don't think Katie talked to me for two days. Oh, no. so, so. <laughs> it was like your fault. Yeah. It's like, well, I just shared an article. I, I didn't even comment on it. I was just like, here's, here's, here's an article. Yeah. I was waiting on her to respond. And I, she either ignored me because I was dumb dad. I knew this like eight years ago because I paid too much attention. <laughs> Or I upset her by sharing that with her, and she, I haven't, I haven't clarified which is which yet. Yeah, but I'm, I'm sure we had a conversation about the upcoming Grammys. Mm. And she's all excited about some announcement that she thinks Taylor Swift is going to make, and and I said, well, if she, if she uses, and and the way she painted the scenario, she was like, if Taylor wins, she's going to announce something from the stage, and my response to that was, well, that's tacky. I hope she doesn't do that, mm. and that's. That wasn't the right thing to say to my daughter. Oh, so. yeah. So we'll see. But that's coming up and we'll talk. We'll probably talk about the Grammys next time we're out. So all right. that'll be fun. Anyway. All right. We're uh, we're we're sipping on a bourbon and I'm out. So we're going to take a quick break for a refill. Take a moment, if you will, to listen to more about the awesome sponsors that help make the show happen, including Musk Ox Flannels, the best flannels in the whole wide world. 
You can go to gomuskox.com slash rambler, use the code rambler and get a discount on the flannels that are buttery soft and built like a tank, just like me. When we come back, we will listen to my recent conversation with Paul, Rich, and Ben, three of the members of Digby. They are back with their first album in 17 years. It comes out March 1st. So if you're hearing this in the first few days after the podcast drops, you're going to hear samples before anyone. It's kind of an exclusive. So don't go anywhere. This is Roots Music Rambler. Hey, Ramblers, I have experienced a revolution in sound in my house, and you can too. The revolution is driven by Sonos. The Sonos wireless music system lets you play any song in any room, control it all with the Sonos app on your phone or tablet. Sonos has all the connections to give you millions of songs and stations, including connecting to your iTunes, your Spotify, Pandora, and more. Get a wireless Sonos player and hear the sound quality difference. Then get one for all the rooms in your house where you listen, but might be out of reach of the stereo or Bluetooth speaker you normally use. So I've got one in my bedroom and bathroom for when I get ready in the morning. I've got one in the kitchen and living room for when I'm hanging out with friends. And then down here in the office den for when I'm working or setting up for another episode of the show, I happen to like the Sonos Move, which is one of the speaker models. I can put it out on my patio for cookouts. It's a weather-resistant design, has an 11-hour battery life, so I don't need to plug it in out there when I have people over for cookouts or tailgates or whatever. And I can play music on all or just a few of the speakers, so I never lose my jams going from room to room. Try the move and hear the difference, then hook up all the rooms in your house for an excellent listening experience while you move around cleaning or dancing or whatever you do in the privacy of your own home. Listen to Roots Music Rambler on it, for God's sakes. It makes me sound even more handsome. Go to rootsmusic.link slash Sonos, S-O-N-O-S, rootsmusic.link slash Sonos. That'll take you right to the Sonos Move speaker page to purchase. I highly recommend it. And you'll love how much better your music and podcasts sound. Go to rootsmusic.link slash Sonos. That's rootsmusic.link slash Sonos. We find ourselves drinking gloves even from the brackish depths of its tributaries But love is love And life is messy that way The music that brought us back from a break there is called Love is Love. It's the first single off Digby's brand new album. Their first in 17 years. The LP is called Happy Little Heartache. And I got to admit, this is kind of a fanboy moment for me because today on the show, I am talking to Paul Rich and Ben, three of the five members of the band Digby. Welcome, gentlemen. Great to talk to you guys. Hola. Good to talk to you. Now, I've got a a whole lot to dig into here, but let's start out where it all started. Where did you guys meet? How did you come to know each other? How did you come to know each other played music? And what was that path that eventually led to the first iteration of the band, which was 100 Acre Wood, I believe? I first met Paul in high school when he asked me for a ride home. We went to high school together. What was the name of that place, Paul? Do you remember? I have no clue. Yeah, but it was in Clarksville, (laughs) Indiana. And Mark Book, who's the drummer, who's, who's not here. He was in our class and Paul was in our class or my class or our class. And he came up to me after school and asked for a ride home because I actually had a car and I was flaunting my keys. Look, I have a car. And um, I don't remember what happened. I don't know if we like made out on that trip or on the next one, but yeah. something happened. You know, I, I'm a, I'm definitely a two date minimum. So, <laughs> and then the other piece of that is that Rich's parents and my parents went to the same church and that's how he and I knew each other, but we didn't officially meet that way. Uh, it was just sort of, you know, coincidental. Um, it wasn't until years Later, as Ben and I were forming the original group, uh, Hundred Acre Wood, that trying to think of which came first, 
was it John or was it Rich? It was John, wasn't it? Well, well, it was. we we had a friend also in Hundred Acre Wood named John Spitznagel, and he was mm. good friends with Rich. And we were thinking, hey, we want to re- record some of this stuff that we've been working on. And John said, I know this guy named Rich who's got a four track or an eight track recorder in his basement. Maybe he'll do it. And that's how we met Rich. Got involved. There you go. But, but did John come first? Was John, John Spitznagel. No, 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 John Shiner. No, it was he came that. later. That was before John ended. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I could. I mean, this was so long ago. <laughs> <laughs> it's all blending together now. <laughs> I love it. I love it. We're kicking off the cobwebs, which is good. Yeah. That's kind of that's kind of the point. When did you? So you guys start start recording and, and playing around in, in basements and whatnot. When did you actually say, "Hey, let's let's go do gigs. Let's be a real band." What was that? Yeah, that we day recorded like? a full album in my parents' basement with that eight track recorder, and then the first wow. gig we actually did was the carl casper custom auto show which we placed third in yeah and won four microphones <laughs> i still got the trophy yeah they absolutely <clears throat> hated us because it was all <laughs> metal bands you know we were not popular the judges liked us though <laughs> we like being judged in fact we started playing and practicing and working together in the fall of 94 carl casper was january of 95 and wow I distinctly re- remember after we did the little three song set walking off and thinking, I could get used to that. That's, that isn't too bad. And yeah. then we didn't Not win. Me. And I, I, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then, then after that, we started playing coffee houses around Louisville and we would play for like three hours. <laughs> yeah. Three songs went to three That's hours. And, yeah. Was it, was it all acoustic back then or were you guys ju- juiced up? Rich was juiced up. I was the, I was, me and Ben were the only electric ones. Yeah. I played a 12 string guitar back then, and I do not recommend it. <laughs> nice. A 12 string acoustic, no, no less. And uh, yeah, it was um, after you've done that for four hours and then you do it again for another four hours, you're like, mm, I should consider something else. Mm-hmm. I think uh, 100 Acre Wood was more, probably more folksy and more harmony driven. So it was really acoustic based. Yeah. And it was, it was honestly rich and marked. It sort of made us turn up, turn up the volume more than anything. And, uh, <laughs> well, by the time they did that, so I first saw you guys play, I think it was probably 1997 or eight or so. And I believe the first place I saw you play was at the Rudd, Rudyard Kipling. I remember three things about that night. I remember John playing the fiddle, which I thought for like a pop band, that was different and interesting. Um, Ben's, your bass was one of those, I think, Epiphone viola basses, the, the old Paul McCartney model, which I, I thought was, was super cool. It just looked cool. And you guys did approximately an approximately 37 minute rendition of Whipping Post. And <laughs> I was I was absolutely hooked. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. No, it was it was great because I was literally I had I had just flown in. I was I worked in New York at the time and I had come back to visit my girlfriend who I eventually married and she came out to see you guys. I came with her. I was dead tired. I was about to fall asleep. And then you guys launched into whipping post. I was like, okay, I can get into this. And I just sat there going, Jesus, these guys can play. And so, frankly, covering the Allman Brothers is enough to qualify you for an interview on this show because we typically talk about Americana, roots music and whatnot, which I think is, as you were saying, is probably a little bit more into the Hundred Acre Wood sound. But I also know that, you know, you've got some interesting, you know, influences that come out in your music. So. I'd love to know what other bands and sounds you guys are say in your DNA because I can pick out some funk, I can pick out some blues and and folk, and then of course there's the whole shiner phase with the fiddle that that added a neat dimension to the band's sound, but that's been gone for a while. What influences are mixed in there for for each of you? Well, I was going to say uh, re- regarding John and the fiddle, we first got John in whenever we were trying to make those first recordings in uh, Rich's basement because we knew a guy who played uh, cello. And we wanted a guy to come in and put down a cello track. And this guy was like, Hey, I have a friend who plays violin. Do you want, do you want him to come too? And we were like, yeah, sure. Why not? And what happened was the cello guy never showed up, but John, the violin player did. And it was just (laughs) supposed to be for one song and he never left. So, (laughs) and I remember thinking that the violin was so neat to have in a pseudo rock setting. And I, I, I always was very, I thought if I had been somebody coming in to to see us, I would have really thought that that was interesting and wanted to 
see how do you put a violin into a 30 minute rendition of uh whipping post and, <laughs> it, it, those were great and i i do miss <laughs> that he doesn't bring out the violin anymore because he could he totally could but he just he's so like a lot of the influences back then were pretty loose as we kind of said they you know it was very folk oriented back then so you know Carsby Stills and Nash were one of my influences in terms of writing and also our mentors at the time were some members of a local band back then called Zen Penguin which I don't know if you remember them or not but it was they were they were our age the, the age we are today back then yeah and uh okay <laughs> you know they were pretty influential it was very you know folksy singer songwriter harmony driven acoustic so that was a that was a huge influence on us back then now i could say going forward it, it that evolved into us finding our own voice that was more brit rock oriented but we still we never got away from those kinds of, of folky roots and so we have a very eclectic collection of of influences from the the beatles to you know i mean today it's just all over the map and and there are still some like in this new record we still have some uh folksy i don't i shouldn't say folksy but americana oriented uh songs there's a couple of them there's some that are kind of old Digby. There's some that are brand new Digby that's, you know, we branch into a, a different kind of sound that we've never really done before, or maybe we're just doing it better. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's all over the map today. I would say I'm a huge Robin Hitchcock fan. I love JD McPherson as an influence and just as a, a producer of, of music, like the way that he makes records today is amazing. And there are very few people doing it like that. Nice. So it's pretty cool. And Rich, I would I would assume that you you bring a little bit more of the kind of blues guitar to the to the group. Yeah, back back in the old days when we were technically like a folk rock band, it was when I joined the band, it was my <laughs> my unspoken mission to turn them into a blues band. And I failed horribly at that. I don't know about that. But uh I was, <laughs> I was trying my best. Yeah, I mean Back then, I mean, I was, I was all about Stevie Ray Vaughan, Jimi Hendrix. And then, like Paul said, you always know, sort of more, we, you know, like discovered later British yeah. bands later for the time, like Blur, Oasis, things like that, that we sort of caught our attention with, you know, nice rock guitars with melody behind it. But also, a lot of that stuff still had some like English folk sure. base to it, as far as like Blur is concerned, and like Robin Hitchcock. You, there's elements of oh, like British folk. I love British folk. <laughs> that are that are in, inside that music. That's sort of I think influences probably both yeah. today. It's good stuff. Yeah, Ben. What about you? How did how did your music DNA form? I started taking. I, I actually I needed two extra credits in uh, college one year to make a full load and. Um, I came late to guitar and I always wanted to do to play guitar and I just never got it, got around to it. And there was a guitar class that was exactly two credits, which would give me the, what I uh, basically needed. So I asked the guy, you know, everybody I know plays guitar. Could you teach me how to play bass? Because I was thinking that if I, if I played bass, then people would want to play with, with me. It was totally selfish and the guy was like yeah sure i can do that so he kind of got me got me started on that and then not two three months after that paul called me and said hey we i heard you're playing bass Do you want to come and sing with me and a friend of mine and i was so excited and scared because i was literally a beginner and i wanted to try to impress them enough to make them want to keep having me so i remember i always brought a little tape re recorder and whenever we would get together and practice i would record everything and then i would go back home and i would practice to that tape for hours and hours just so i could be good enough to keep up with paul and the other guy nate who had been playing for years by that point and i just i was kind of in awe of them to be honest because they were so good and they could sing and uh, harmonize. And I, I just wanted to be able to be there and play with them. So I was, I put more time and effort into those practice tapes than to anything I was doing at, at the uh, college jazz bass class, which I was actually paying to take, you know? So then, you know, from influences then, you know, uh, I got into Bob Dylan because of Paul basically. And in those old Dylan records, the bass player was really prominent 
And he did a lot of roots and fifths, which was easy. So I could do that. I could like imitate that, but it, but it, it, the actual timing was so good. And it, so I really kind of learned from that more than anything, like getting the basic foundational building blocks of, I guess, what a bass should be or try to be. And in terms of influences also, I got to say rich, believe it or not, because I'd never listened to blues at all. And when we first met rich, that's all he talked about. That's all he, he was blues and I started to learn these blues lines so I could play with him and try to keep up with uh, him. And I, it really, I, I got to say, my biggest inf- influences were the other guys in the uh, band. I mean, Mark opened me up to so many like rock concepts I, I had always kind of heard, but never, but never really like focused on. So I was learning more from the guys that I was playing with than what I was hearing over the radio. It should also be said that we were all very huge, big Beatles fans. So I I don't know if that goes without saying, but, you know, (laughs) I met somebody the other day that actually didn't like the Beatles. So, you know, whatever. And that person was (laughs) Pete Best. (laughs) Ben, that's very sweet to say. Jason, it is strange being in a a lead guitar player in a band where I'm like the third best (laughs) guitar player. (laughs) Mark... Mark is is a the drummer, but he is a fantastic guitar player. And when yeah, I guess these, you know, when we asked Mark to join, he came over, and um, we were playing a couple of songs. And I was like, oh, he's a really good drummer. And then we went to go have a have a break, and he said, hey, can I play your guitar? So he picks up my Strat, and he just starts going. <laughs> I'm like, what? The? <laughs> I was like, dude, you should be playing guitar. I'll go back to drums because I mean, I t- I totally play guitar like a drummer, and he plays drums like a guitar player. Wow. So but he's like, no, I want to play drums. I'm like, okay. So <laughs> that's it's the only reason I'm not playing drums, and he's not playing guitar. It's <laughs> his choice. Well, I'm glad it came together the way it did because I think you guys sound fantastic and I want to hear some more of those influences and a little bit more of the new music. We're going to step out for a second, but Taking Us to Break is a song everyone listening to on this episode within a couple days of it dropping will hear this tune for the very first time. It's the first time Roots Music Rambler has debuted a song from a guest, so noteworthy moment for us. Uh, Let's take a little bit of a listen to Mountain. Don't go away. This is Roots Music Rambler. Hey gang, I was not a flannel guy until I found uh, Muskox flannels. Now I don't want to wear anything else. Well, I mean pants, you know, but you know what I mean. Anyway, so Muskox is a premium flannel shirt that comes in various colors and styles, but also all season or heavy. So they have different weights and thicknesses. They even have sizes that fit big boys like me. Now, uh, Frank, I hear the ladies like the flannel look. Is that accurate? Yes. Yeah, there we go. So uh, one Muskox Flannels customer actually said they are buttery soft but built like a tank. I resemble that remark, especially when I'm wearing my Muskox Flannels. They also, by the way, give $10 of every $100 order to support wildlife conservation, so you're doing some good for the earth and the animals on it with every purchase. Visit gomuskox.com slash rambler, browse the collection, and get you some buttery soft built like a tank premium flannels. Make sure you use the code RAMBLER, all caps, and get the discount on your order. That's gomuskox.com slash rambler. Use the code RAMBLER, buttery soft, yo. That might be my new hashtag. Thought I'd become a mountain and cover me with snow. Oh, it's cold on the dark side, but the other side couldn't let you go. No, nothing ever melted there in the rivers, never flowed. There's more. A 
little more of Mountain there from Digby. It's off their new album, Happy Little Heartache, due out March 1st. The Love is Love single is already out there for folks to feast on. You can find them probably all over the interwebs, but digbytheband.com is a great place to go. Ordered my T-shirt uh, the other day, so got that on the way. So I'll be wearing that in a future episode as well. Before I get into the album, though, let me ask about that song, Mountain. It's certainly more of what I'd call an Americana sound. And Paul, you kind of referred to some of the newer music is a little bit more of that sort of Americana flavor. It seems to bring in some of that sort of folk, even slightly country sounds to it. I wonder if that song was kind of written with that in mind, or was that just how the arrangement came together? Well, interestingly, all of these songs, well, no, probably 90% of the songs on this record were written in an acoustic frame. And so it kind of has that was its origin was in an Americana flavor. And we all kind of came together and the album became what it became. That song and, you know, there's a couple others that still retained that just because of the, you know, the vibe was there and, you know, the instrumentation that we decided to go with uh, as we were recording it. But that it, the mountain in particular was uh, very much a, an acoustic through and through i'll say the recording as it is today has way way more vibe than it did in its uh, original state so mm -hmm. yeah so that's one of the 12 new tracks on happy little heartache this is your all's first album in 17 years but i know i've seen you live several times in the interim i don't i don't think you guys ever broke up or anything i think just life just kind of got in the way but what brought you back to writing and recording again well i mean i i never really stopped writing and i and i recorded um a couple solo things that you know i didn't really push you know i had a, a couple tracks that went to fpk but it's not like i was pursuing it uh, because i too had life happening so it was just really to just keep the chops up but us coming together as a group let's let rich tell that <laughs> tale okay <laughs> okay yeah so, is that okay rich yeah that's fine that's fine yeah the last the last gig we played was summer of 2013 i think it was and pretty much after that wow. gig i put the guitar down and left it down <laughs> for a long time for a long time and it was almost to the point i think i was just jaded got jaded by the music industry it was, I mean, we've been doing it for a long time and doing it a lot for a long time. There's a lot of travel involved and just gone. And by 2013, I had two kids. I don't know how Mark was doing all the travel and all that stuff. And he had little kids and, you know, they were growing up now. <laughs> but but by then I had two kids and I was just born out and tired of it. Put them down. And it was to the point where I was getting ready to sell all my gear. And for a year, we never broke up. Oh. But uh, we would get together every couple of months and have dinner and drinks and just, you know, talk and have fun because i mean beyond music we're probably fr friends more than anything else just because we're all <laughs> we're all seem to be of like one mind for the most part maybe not ben but okay but uh <laughs> so yeah i put it down and we'd get together and i wouldn't call it harassment but <laughs> paul especially would would needle me say, come, on, <laughs> come on come on let's let's play it i'm like no nah, i mean let's let's just let's just have a beer <laughs> and go out there and then uh <laughs> Everybody met at a local restaurant on uh, my birthday of 2022, I guess it was. 20, no, yeah, 22. So in June of 2022, and we're all sitting outside, and Paul's sitting next to him, and he, he's say, come on, man, let's just play. And I'm like, my wife has been twisting my arms, like, just get back into it. And then Ben's needling me, and then Mark's there, and they're needling me. And then out of nowhere, from behind me, this lady that used to work for our record label for years, just haven't seen her in probably... 15 years or more just walks up behind me and says hi i'm like okay this i don't really believe in signs but like if there is one i was like this this is one i was like all right let's do it <laughs> so when we when we got back together it wasn't really wow with the mind of making a new record it was just playing for the most part and so we went over to paul's house and played a couple of the old songs and while we're sitting there he goes by the way i have some new ones let's try these i'm like okay let's let's do it. <laughs> let's try it man <laughs> and then he turned the microphone on and here we are. <laughs> wow. So Ben, how was kicking off the dust? I had like four or five bases and none of them really work anymore. So, uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> it's, it's funny. The, the only base I had that actually kind of worked good was the base that I had bought in 2002 as a uh, backup. 
it was a it was this cheap it was like the cheapest bass that I could find, you know. And uh but I'd been kind of like fiddling on and off, but I I always kind of wanted to get back to play with a band because I miss being in a in a band. I I didn't like just kind of being on on my own. Especially as a bass player, you kind of want to have a drummer and somebody else. But I could never really find anybody. And I would ask, you know. <laughs> and, you know, there was a lot of it's not you, it's uh, me type of, you know, things. And it just, it, 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 things would just never work out. So I think Digby spoiled me in a weird way. Like I could never find another kind of such situation that kind of scratched that, that itch. So I actually played on one of Paul's solo records the one that was before this new Digby project. And I used that really cheap bass and I wasn't happy with what I did on it. I, I thought that the bass sounded weird. I, I could tell that I was rusty. And so I decided to get that bass fixed, fixed up. I took it to this uh, luthier guy who was going to do all this work to it. And for whatever reason, I just kind of felt like if Paul ever does another solo album, I want to be ready. So I started to practice more and got the bass up and running and, when we started working on these new songs, I honestly thought we were doing a third solo Paul record, just sort of helping him out here and there. And it kind of became a Digby project. I didn't realize that it was happening. It was one of those slow boil things, you know, where you're the frog in the boiling water. I was the frog. Yeah. I was like, hey, Digby's back suddenly. <laughs> when did that happen? <laughs> but I, I was Rich is here. Yeah. Well. And so, like, whenever whenever Rich had, had told me that he was thinking about selling all of his gu- guitars, I... I was really shocked, but I kind of understood in a weird way because the funniest thing is for this project, when this project got going, he actually bought a new guitar. He bought a new Telecaster. And that so shocked me because not even a year ago, he had he had seriously been talking about selling every amp, every guitar. And here he is buying new stuff. So something was actually happening. I think it was interesting to how this project sort of evolved there wasn't a whole lot of intention at first it was really about stretching our legs you know like getting into it again and it being stress-free i mean we didn't have a scenario anymore where we were having to do you know out-of-town gigs and we weren't trying to make money you Mm -hmm. know like if anybody wants to eat three square meals a day don't become a musician but we weren't in that scenario anymore so there was a lot of freedom to just be relaxed Um, and if i could you know equate it to anything the whole experience was about love you know love of our families love of playing music um, love of each other you know just enjoying the experience so it was very relaxed and that i think was the primary conduit that allowed the project to become what it became did it make the music better oh yeah i I think think so so. good i mean i i am dangerously in love with this record i mean i've never (laughs) (laughs) i have never uh, i mean i don't know i loved what we did in the past and i don't have any bad feelings about that stuff but you know it's always the 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 latest thing that you just worked on is your favorite thing and this sure. is like my favorite thing that we've ever done ever so well wow. this is uh the first record since the first hundred acre wood cassette that came out in 1995 we've been the only creative input on the whole thing uh other ones that, that there yeah, were other people right. involved like producers or record companies or just even just studio engineers i mean this was all done mm-hmm. yeah. soup to nuts from from the ground up completely us there's no other engineers producers and paul's yeah. doing all that so, as far as recording the thing so it's been all us wow those uh years where paul worked on his own solo stuff and uh he also re- recorded other groups too uh, he got really good at knowing how to be a producer and how to be an engineer and just so Paul, he's being very, no, kind. no I'm being serious. I mean, I mean, Paul literally built a, a studio in uh, his basement and through all those years of trial and error, there, there you go. Little studio tour. Um, Paul fun. got nice. really good at knowing what to do by the, by the time we went down there to try to add stuff to it. So a lot of this work was done by Paul. Honestly, if this uh, record sounds good at, at all, it's because of Paul. Pshaw! It's it was a <laughs> and lot. If it of sounds bad, it's because of Mark. 
(laughs) (laughs) Everyone had a lot of input. You know, I, my goal at the beginning of this was to not be a dictator, you know, just because I was pressing buttons. It needed to be, everybody needed to have input, and equal input into how this evolved and, and become what it became. And that, and that kind of, again, mm-hmm. that kind of freedom that we had, there was no pressure, um, really made for a, a wonderful experience. Nice. So I know John Shiner is back with the group, which I know your core Hundred Acre Wood era Wood fans are probably super excited about. How did that reunion come about? Was he just kind of always there and decided to come back and play, or had you guys lost track of him over the years? What? How did that happen? He had left before Digby stopped playing. Like after we recorded in 2008, I think it was a series of EPs, and uh, he was involved in those, and then he uh, he had dipped out for for personal reasons, and then he moved away. And we still played locally around town, just the four of us. And then, I mean, we didn't really have hardly any much contact with him at all. And then I guess in 2022, he had moved back and I heard he, he had via Facebook. And so we were having one of our dinners <laughs> again. And I just reached out to him and said, hey, why don't you, you want to come meet us? Or, you know, I knew he lived in Indiana. It's like, we're meeting over there. Why don't you stop on by? And he just showed up. And just like in 1994, he never left. <laughs> he knows he knows how to stick around. Yeah, That's, does, good. Yeah. That's good. I literally I literally said, John, I've got some material that I would love for you to work on. Would you would you be willing? And he said, I'm a little rusty, but yeah, I mean, just you know, and he tried to give me disclaimers and I was like, All you had to do is say yes. <laughs> Yeah, I'm. I'm nice. sorry, Jason. We don't. We don't have any like dramatic stories for you. There was no fist fights. No. Uh, no. Uh, you'll never play in this town again. Stories. You know. It just. You know. They just kind of happen. <laughs> those. Okay. Those happen. Just. Just not, not with, with us. us. Yeah. You know. just, uh... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think that's one of the things that that I've why I've been such a fan of your alls for so many years is because you guys seem to be always there. And of course, I, I I had the advantage of being somewhat tangential to your friend group. So I'm friends with a couple of you on Facebook and whatnot. So I see family. I see the pictures from the dinners and whatnot. So I'm always like, this is I love this band because even though they're not playing anymore right now, they're still just friends. And I think that's what makes great music and great bands is when, you know, you have, as Paul said, you have that love for each other. And I think that comes out in things. And so it's certainly for your live shows that I remember seeing back in the day, I could tell you guys were, you know, a family and a unit on stage, which was great. And so I didn't expect any, you know, wild fistfight stories because I was around you enough to know you probably didn't do that. So (laughs) that's all cool. Speaking of, are you guys, you know, planning on going back to the grindstone with live gigs? I thought you were going to say, I'm going to be able to see you play live again. I thought you were going to say, are you guys planning on having a a fight? (laughs) Yeah. Are you planning on? (laughs) Good. We have have an annual fistfight scheduled (laughs) once a year. And uh, get out of our system. uh, Actually, yeah. yeah. (laughs) We're courting venues to do a, a live show. We haven't found nice. the right place yet, or I don't know, we're still contemplating um, the right place. Uh, just, mm-hmm. I think we want our live experience to be special, not just a, uh, a regular bar gig. You know, we want it to yeah. be special for people coming to see us as well as sure. for us. I don't know. It's been a while. So, you know, <laughs> so, well, we, so we definitely want to make it special, but there's probably, you know, we're going to do other things. Um, it would be nice to have you know, an all ages show. Cause you know, there are kids now who would kind of like to see what right. the old man is doing. And stuff like that. <laughs> That's true. Well, I, for one, will certainly be there. Uh, hey, great. I'm not missing this shit. If you guys play live again, I'm there. So I want to know we'll one please. of the tunes I'm guessing if if you do play live again, uh, is another one off of the new album, Happy Little Heartache. Let's jump out for a quick break so we can hear a little bit more of another tune that has, uh, I think, more of an Americana vibe to it than some previous Digby stuff. This is Mayfly from Digby on Roots Music Rambler. You're breaking out on another day Everyone's let down when they learn of the true Blue Jay Yeah 
ancient flight in the common era in your wig and your wings posing for the camera newspapers and photographs and scraps of the film I'm just a bus With old tired wheels That won't move through the rust And every bullet coming from across the way Just preparing me for my judgment Last time, another exclusive debut clip here on Roots Music Rambler from Digby. Paul Rich and Ben are here with us. We've been talking about their first album in 17 years. It's called Happy Little Heartache. Comes out March 1st. And what I've heard of it is a very familiar sound from a band I've loved and followed for a long damn time. Paul, what, if anything, in the album or the sound or the vibe of the band is different in 2024 than the heyday years, maybe the early 2000s. You touched on it a little bit, but I'd love to have you specifically tell us what's what's really different this time around. Oh, wow. Do you mean in terms of the songwriting or the sound itself? I think, yeah, both probably. I think I'm interested in mm-hmm. both. I would say in terms of songwriting, I think we approached this a little differently. The the songs themselves, with a couple exceptions, were mostly finished uh, in terms of its structure. I mean, we molded it a little bit as we came together. And I would say probably my ability as a individual songwriting contributor got better. I, I hope <laughs> <laughs> that's my that's my hope. So with that kind of piece completed as people came in that sound we just sort of let that sound kind of evolve naturally which is a little different than the way we did things before before like i said there was a lot of pressure involved so we all got together in this cramped room and if there was anything approaching a fist fight before it was during these sessions um not because uh we were angry with each other it was just it got to be very it could be very frustrating Uh, you know, trying to get, you know, oh, well, we're going to do this here. We're going to do this there. And so this evolved in a very much more relaxed way. So that's different. And the sound itself is a bit more refined, um, if I can use that word. Yeah. Like, I think we did a much better job of knowing our roles for the individual song. Like, because... It wasn't quite as chaotic. For example, as Rich came in, you know, we would have a discussion about, you know, hey, what's what does the song need? What's missing? You know, Rich was like, how can I make this better? And and I would think in the past, we had a habit of kind of not going through that step. Mm. Uh, you know, it was just kind of chaos. We all kind of came together and the song became what it what became because, you know, this is the part I'm going to play and I'm not going to deviate from that because it's what I'm, you know, I'm, right. I'm going to do. And not out of malice or of ego. It was more just lack of experience, probably. And I think today we're, we're far more mature uh, (laughs) musicians and people. And I think we were very, nobody wanted to step on anybody, you know, as we were making this, it was very elegant. Nice. That's a good word. We're leaving more space for each of us. Yeah. In the, in the songs itself, you know, that was one of the very first things I think we we said at the very first meeting, like this, let's just make space here. Yeah. Well, like, I mean, that song never made it. (laughs) But that's where it started. <laughs> like B.B. King says, you say as much as with what you don't say is what you do say. So, yeah. you know, back in the day, we were all about yeah. like, blah, here's all our stuff. Like guitar, guitar, yeah. guitar, drum, bass, blah, blah, blah. It's all out there now. But now I think with this project, we were like, you know, let's let's say something and say it with the music and what we decide to put in and what we decide to take out. Because uh, Paul and I had mixed this record and there's there's a lot of things that we – had recorded and put on that was like, you know, that guitar's just not working there. There's another song on there called in the garden where there's a whole guitar part of mine that we we're playing it. And it's like this, 
it's not working. John had a nice piano line in there. He's like, well, let's take my guitar out and see what it sounds like. And it works. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, now I, I have a guitar part in there still, but not through the whole song. Yeah. But, you know, it works better that way. It's like, well, it's, that's better for the song. And plus now I get to have a break if we do play live. <laughs> I'll sit down for an hour for 30, 30, three minutes or so. Ben, what's your take on the new album? It's, it was very, um, <laughs> why am I blanking? I don't know. He has no, <laughs> that, that, that first time that we, um, that, that we got there and we kind of played together for the very first time we were, we were going over old Digby songs and it was like, okay, I kind of remember what to do. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. This is nice. And the minute we started playing Paul's new stuff, I could just tell everyone's attention just you know, got more focused. People started saying, Oh, we should, we should do this here or Hey, hold on there. Hit this bam here. Give me a sippy um, blap and tap here on the uh, drums, you know? And it's, it's like the minute we started working on new stuff, it suddenly felt like something had actually changed. Like a switch had actually flipped and we weren't just going through the motions of like the older things that we had kind of fallen into in our last years, whenever we were out playing, because we weren't really making any new songs. We, we, we were just doing it for fun and, to get some extra spending cash by that, by that point. So by the, by, by the time we started doing that, these brand new ones, it was like something I didn't realize was missing from my life was suddenly back. And I was, I was excited. And so every time going to Paul's little studio was just, it was so much fun and it didn't have this pressure of, we have to do something great because we want to make this our job and, make this our living and we we have to make this work there's people depending on us the label wants something to happen um we need to get dental insurance out of out of this somehow i don't know how you know <laughs> like paul write me a dental insurance song you know <laughs> something that's gonna <laughs> save my teeth please <laughs> so we didn't have any of that and it was just it was the most loose the, the most laid back and it's it it just was it was painless yeah, I, I, I really hope we make a second one because there's about five or six songs that, that didn't make this album that we're actually putting out. And there's one in particular, which I really like, and I really want to get out there. So I really hope we make some more because now that we've gotten back into this, I don't want to stop just yet. <laughs> if that's okay with you four guys. Well, I'm get I'm for those who are listening and not not watching anything here. I just got nods and thumbs up, so I'm thinking we might be able to expect another Digby album down the road, which is speaking on behalf of Digby fans is probably other than a new album is out now, the best goddamn thing we could hear yeah. is there might be something else coming down the pipe too. So, super super excited about that and you can hear in your talking about the album that it's just going to it's just going to be awesome because there's so much enthusiasm and and the the process being sort of painless makes makes for good damn music. So, I've heard four Amen. cuts off this thing and I love all four of them and I can't wait to hear the rest as I'm sure the other fans would attest. So, you. you guys have always been one of my all-time favorite bands. I think I told you guys kind of off mic a few minutes ago. I think I wore out at least one if not two copies of laughing at the trees on CD back in the day. And I've always appreciated those handful of times we had a beer or chatted here or there over the years. I'm sorry if I ever came across as a weirdo stalker guy, you had to keep an eye on, but, <laughs> but thank you for the music, for the fun, for coming on the show. I'm super pumped. You've got new music out there and uh, I hope everyone's going to get a little digby on them soon. So thanks for coming by fellas. Thank well, you. James thanks for, for being a stalker. <laughs> Everyone needs yeah. one. Maybe, uh, maybe uh, we should be selling some means Digby more than you towels would know. to get the Digby off you. Every, every time I run into Rich and Becky somewhere, <laughs> Becky has this look like, keep an eye on him. He may follow us home. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, oh, it's him again. <laughs> so, but anyway, uh, let's do a live. little more love is love as we send these guys back to uh, plan more of this comeback tour. It's about time y'all did this again. And thanks for uh, checking off a big box of this fanboys bucket list. Great having you guys on the show. This is more love is love from Happy Little Heartache. It's Digby out March 1st. This is Roots Music Rambler. With love so messy, let's slip and fall in it. Love's like a rattlesnake, let's go and get it. If you put the kettle on, I'll grab the tea. If there's a message in these signs, not to be fooled, it's by design. And don't be fooled to turn away. Don't.
Welcome back to Roots Music Rambler. We've reached that time on the big program where we call it the pick and the grinning. Uh, which artists do we pick that are making us grin this week, this month, whatever? Might be somebody new that you've never heard of and we're recommending new music to you. Might be something old that we like that we're kind of reminding you of or sending you to for the first time, which we have a tendency to do sometimes too. And so I'm going to give Frank a break this time and I'm going to go first. I normally <laughs> bring, I normally throw her under the bus right out of the gate and we'll give her a second to think of somebody. But I actually, I'm not sure if the, the 60 second album review uh, on our social channels has dropped yet on this one by the time you hear this. Uh, so I don't mean to spoil it for everyone, but I've been listening to Miles Miller's new album. And Miles Miller, if you don't know who that is, he's the drummer for Sturgill Simpson. And Sturgill Simpson produced this album. He's been producing a lot of albums lately since his last album didn't come out. His last album was like 2019 or something. But anyway, uh, he produced Miles Miller. And Miles is actually from Versailles, Kentucky. Not Versailles. 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 Um, I've been there. Yeah. he's He was Woodford County High School. So it's just a little south and a little uh, east. Uh, or West, rather, of Lexington, Kentucky. And he was brilliant in his arrangements of some of Sturgill's music. He was, you know, instrumental in Sturgill's live shows and whatnot. And if you ever, if you see Sturgill play live and Miles is the drummer, the, the only time I saw Sturgill play live, Sturgill has a tendency to turn around and like lock eyes with Miles and they like jam and there's nobody else in the room except those two guys. Uh, which I thought was a little weird, but at the same time, I, c I can see why, because they have this like musical connection or whatever. But anyway, so Miles Miller's new album is actually, it's very good. It's very good music. It's very good. The, the arrangements are great. It's a really good, just kind of country Americana album. The songs are good. He's got a, a very good voice, which he's always sung kind of backup and harmonies with Sturgill. So now his voice is coming out, which I'm, I'm really happy about. It sounds really good. The one thing I will say, though, and I say this in the 60 second album review too, if I have a criticism, it's not much of one because it's a very good album and I recommend uh, you go check it out. Uh, but if I have a criticism at all, it's that the lyrics come across to me like someone's lyrics from their first album. And, and what I mean by that is they seem pretty predictable. Like the rhymes are kind of predictable okay. and, and you're, it's, it, it seems a little, I don't want to say immature. That's not yeah. the right word. But it's not fully baked, if you know what I mean, right? Polished. He, he's not an experienced lyricist yet. Gotcha. But there's a ton of potential. Like, I I heard this album and immediately was like, I can't wait till his second or third album. Nice. Because he's going to be really, really good. Yeah. And he's he's good. I mean, he's good now. Don't get me wrong. But I can see a lot of potential in him. The songs are, are well written. The lyrics, again, a little, I don't, it's amateur is not the right word. Immature is not the right word, but they're not complex. Like there's gotcha. not those typical kind of clever turns of phrases in country songs that make you go, oh, okay, that's a clever turn of phrase. Yeah. Um, there's, there's not a lot of that, but that was the only thing that I thought that was even mildly to the negative when I was listening to this album. I really enjoyed it. I thought it was really good. I think I put five cuts on my playlist, which is strong especially for a you know first time album from somebody so miles miller check that out i think the name of the album is just miles miller i'll, I'll look okay. that up while while you're doing to make sure i'm i'm not screwing that up but miles miller no the name of the album is solid gold oh so the name of the album is solid gold miles miller definitely uh, my pick it's making me grin this week so francesca you're up what do you got very nice so nothing really new to me but i was getting all like weepy the last couple of weeks because it's been five years i realized that five years ago just like at the end of january i was the first time i traveled to dublin ireland to attend a trad fest it's a music festival and a lot of it is traditional irish music but there are acts from pretty much all over that show up in dublin to perform at this festival and the first time I went was in 2019. And man, that was the time of my life. And I was introduced to so much new music and that I still love. And then, you know, rediscovered some old favorites. And actually, 
I met a friend who I still keep in touch with, who is a musician in Dublin. Actually, we connected via Twitter before I even went out to Dublin and ended up meeting him. His name is Billy Tracy. Ended up meeting him when I was in Dublin and hanging out with him and his bandmates. And it was just the best time ever. Actually, Billy was the very first, my very first podcast guest on the first version of Roots Music Rambler. Yeah. So I was just, you know, like damn Facebook and Instagram, right? With all these like memories that pop up and stuff. And so I was reminded of that time in Dublin. And then not that long ago, I was driving in the car with my son and on Outlaw Country, one of my favorite like Irish songs comes on and it's Fisherman's Blues by the Waterboys. Okay. And a Billy and his band play, well, they used to, I don't know if they do, but they, they would play it a lot. And it just made me so emotional, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh. I mean, it's a great song anyway, but, you know, having heard it in a very intimate setting at a small pub in Dublin with, you know, friends just doing what they love to do. Yeah, it really brought me back. So the Waterboys and then Billy Tracy and Carlos Nunez, which, you know what, I got to send his people an email because he would be, it would be just fantastic to talk to him and talk about his craft. He plays the Gaita, which is like a Spanish bagpipe. And I'm probably not describing that correctly. Spanish bagpipes. We'll have to edit that out. So it's like Spanish bagpipes. And okay. I saw him the first time I went to Tradfest. And it is up there as one of the best live performances I've ever seen. So yeah, so that's my pick in the grinning. So I recommend checking out any of those musicians, bands that I've mentioned. That's a great one. I like that a lot. I've been to London a couple of times. I've never been to Ireland. So that's on a bucket list for me. I also need to go up into the north of England as well, which which Karen's a big like Morrissey Smith's cure. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Fan. So I'm sure if we ever go over there together, she's dragging me up through all that stuff, which I, I don't mind. I think that'd be fantastic. As she should. That. Yeah, I'm, absolutely. I've told her before when it comes to they call them boot gazers uh, when they, the, the, the boot, ga- boot gaze in music that old. Yeah. You know, the goth where the kids wear the boots and they stare at their boots the whole time while the music is playing. So the boot gazer phase, I never I never got into those bands. I didn't dislike them, but I just did. I never got into them. Yeah. And and so but she loves them. So I haven't quite gone there yet. I'm still going through my Ryan Adams, catching up with her on Ryan mm-hmm. Adams. But I'm eventually going to get into some Smiths and Morrissey's and Cures and things like that and try to Learn myself some stuff about them there Brits up there in the boot gazing phase. So I'm looking forward to that. Oh, well, that sounds like it's going to be a lot of fun. (laughs) Well, yeah. (laughs) The only thing I really know about that music is it sounds real depressing. So, (laughs) well, you know, and then in all fairness, people say the same thing about Boy Genius. You know, that's fair. Yeah. And even Adele. Like, do you remember there was a meme going around on the interwebs? few years back like what do people do at an Adele concert do they just like stand there and cry like you know (laughs) (laughs) and I I get it so but yeah that type of music as you call it the boot gazing definitely has its own audience serves us serves a purpose you know I got into it a little bit that was like my high school days I got into it a little bit but not a whole lot so well uh, the only thing I really know about the music is what I've you know, read or heard in documentaries. And the, the summary of it all is Morrissey's a prick. That's what I know. So <laughs> all right. Roots Music Rambler is a production of Falls and Partners, copyright 2024. Our theme music is Sheep Skin and Beeswax by Gent Decorum. Join us online at rootsmusicrambler.com and make sure you mash that subscribe or follow button so you remember to join us for the next hoedown and throwdown. She's Frank. He's Falls. And whatever you do, kids, ramble on. By the way, you guys will appreciate this. And again, I'm a fucking admitted fanboy, so forgive me. But I walked out this morning. I was at my girlfriend's house this morning. And I walked out and there was frost on the 
windshield and i immediately went on a cold and frosty morning let's go ah wow man i just jumped right into it so yeah man. <laughs> Sorry. i wore i, don't I, even think, I think i wore out i think i wore out two laughing at the trees cds like i played them so oh, much wow. in my car back then that they didn't work anymore There's, thank you you know what's funny awesome. about about that song the one that you that you just referenced the on the cold and frosty morning. Rich just recently found the quote unquote the quote un, unquote video that we shot for that. Oh it was, wow! It was stuck on the back of a, a VHS tape, <laughs> and uh, our friend Bill uh, Green had shot it. And we were in a pedal cart basically, and the camera was just on us driving this pedal cart, and we had forgot all about it. And I had this big box of uh, videotapes from like live stuff and i didn't know yeah. how to transfer it over and i was sick of tripping over it and i gave it to rich who had the actual plugs that you need to get the video off the videotape and put on the yep. and so he was going through it and he uh found that video and he put it on do we have an official youtube channel is is that where it is yeah it's rich? uh youtube digby the band as well yeah okay so it's got this grainy video tape texture to it so it's not as clear as it probably was 40, 50 years ago, but uh, <laughs> that was a neat little uh, find because I completely forgot for, forgot about it. And uh, That's fun. That's good stuff. Yeah. For some reason, I slap Rich in the face at the very end, and I don't remember why. So that could be the closest to an argument that we ever videos. had caught on, caught on film. So There you go. Your annual <laughs> fist fight. I like it. 